you've got your Bibles and want to open with me to uh, Romans chapter 12 uh, this morning, that's where we're going to be launching off from. We're going to be jumping around quite a bit, as you can tell from looking at your bulletin, but uh, we're going to, going to use Romans 12 as our, our launching point. Um, we've been doing this series called Created for Significance for five weeks now. Next week will be our, our last uh, sermon in this series. And uh, I've been getting a, a question more the, over the last, um, I would say, two or three weeks, really, as we've gotten deeper into the series. And I've been surprised because I've been getting this question from, from people um, of kind of broad ranges, right? So uh, this week I got this question from a teenager who's in our youth group and um, is going through those teenage years. Y'all remember the teenage years? I know you tried to forget them, but uh, it's a tough season of life when you're a teenager and you're, you're trying to move from, from being a child to being an adult and you're kind of in that in-between stage. And I, I got the exact same question this week from an 80-year-old too. And uh, the 80-year-old is a widower, uh, lost his wife about a year ago and uh, has been in a major transition in his own life. And uh, tr- just, they're both trying to figure kind of the same thing out, but in different ways. And really everybody who's asked me this question over the last two or three weeks has, has been kind of, they've been in different scenarios and circumstances and situations, but they're all kind of going through the same thing. And the question they've asked is this, Pastor Pete, do you really believe that God created me for significance? You've been talking about it, you've been preaching about it, you've been saying it, but do you really believe that God created me for significance? That that me and my teenage years where nothing makes sense and everything's kind of chaotic and Um, you know, you're going through all the ups and downs of of that. Do you really think that God has a plan and a purpose and a future for me? You may have felt like that as a teenager yourself, or maybe you're in the situation of the gentleman who's in his 80s, and he's kind of through what he considers to be the prime of his life, and, um, you know, he's he's now transitioned into this lonely stage in life where uh, the love of his life is gone, and, and all purpose and meaning and and significance of life seems to be over, and he's wondering why God still has him here. Do you think God really created me for significance, that, that there's still something God wants me to do that's significant? And my answer to everybody who's asked me that question has been a resounding yes. I genuinely believe that God has a great, wonderful, awesome, amazing plan for our lives. For each and every one of us, wherever we're at on our timeline, you have been created for a purpose. You have been created on purpose. God has a plan for you, a significant plan. But it doesn't always feel that way, does it? It doesn't always feel like God created us for significance. I think one of the main reasons for that is because many of us um, we, we have been, I'll use the word, we've been misled and we've, we've misunderstood what it means to be devoted to God. You see, many, many of us feel that, that being devoted to God is a way to find significance in our life, and, and that's true, and that's what we're going to talk about today is our devotion and its importance in us finding our significance. But when it comes to being a disciple of Jesus, when it comes to being a fully devoted disciple of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, for most Christians, they see devotion to God in one of two main ways. They, they, they see it as a way to get something from God, right? I'm going to be devoted to God, so God will give me something. Or so God will do something for me. It's a way to get things from God. Or they see it as their means to do things for God. It's either a way to get stuff from God or a way to check boxes and do things for God. And and that's really not what devotion to God is about. You see, the reality is, is our devotion is not about what we get from God or what we do for God. Our devotion is about what we give to God. 
If I had to sum it all up and just simplify it and boil it all down into one point, which y'all probably wish I would if you've looked at the bulletin today. But if I had to boil it all down into one point, it would be this, and this is the big idea for today. It's not about getting more. It's about giving more. You see, being devoted is not about get, uh, uh, getting more from God. It's about giving more to God. Now, I know many of you are worn out and overwhelmed, and the thought right now of giving anything more to anyone, even the Lord, is terrifying. But I promise this is going to make sense as we work our way through it. Who has the Rubik's Cube that was passed around? Bring it up here. As you bring it up, mix it up. How many of y'all touched the Rubik's Cube and mixed it up on your way in? Good. A lot of you. Uh, that was the idea. Uh, I want my son to come up here as well. Here, stay up here for just a second. Keep mixing it for a minute. There are 43, y'all come over here towards center stage so y'all can be on the screen. You got to be on the screen. 43 quintillion ways to mix this up. So it has been mixed up by a lot of you. Uh, we didn't set this up before. You haven't put it in any certain order, have you? It's just a random order. Okay, it's one of the, thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause. You can go back to your seat. 43 quintillion ways for this puzzle to be mixed up. How many of you have ever tried to solve one of these? Yeah, and me too, a lot. Um, how many of you have ever solved one? Just a few of us, that's right. Steve, you want to come up here and do it? Oh, and he says, no, that was a long time ago. We're going to let my son solve it, get up here right center stage, right in the front for everybody. And while he's doing that, I'm going to talk a little bit. So 43 quintillion ways for this thing to be mixed up. And I'm using this today because it, it's kind of a, uh, an example of life. If you've ever felt like your life was mixed up, like there's 43 quintillion ways for us to mix up our lives, amen. And, and we're trying hard to get everything to line up in life. We're trying hard to get everything to come together. And the idea for this is to get all the colors on the right sides, right? But it, it's really, really hard. And it's, for me, it, with life and with the Rubik's Cube, it seems like the harder I try, the more messed up I get it. <laughs> Amen? Have you ever done that? Like, I'll get to a place with this puzzle and I'll, I'll be like, okay, I'm on the right track. And then I look at the other side and it's mixed up worse than it was before. And I'm like, how in the world is this ever going to come together? And the reality is, is the Rubik's Cube itself um, isn't that hard to solve if you know how to solve it. There are what they call algorithms, which is what he's doing here to move the colors around and to get everything on the right side of things. And just like that, it's done. Give my son Peter a round of applause. Thank you, son. You can go sit down. It happens really quick. Wait, son, how many algorithms are there? How many algorithms did you just use to solve this? Yeah, it was like five, five or six. So if you know five or six methods, tricks, algorithms, you can solve this. And you can learn those and you can memorize those like he has and, and you can get it all in order. Can I just tell you, when it comes to life, there's only a few things we really need to do to get things in order. Just a few. Re read this with me in Romans 12, 1 through 2. Paul says this, he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, so this is for all of us, for the church, for disciples, he says, In view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That's the goal. That's what we're talking about today. How do we do that? And then he says, this is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. We're really picking up here where we left off last week because last week we said that God's mercy makes all the difference. And here... Paul says, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. But the question is, how do we do that? I mean, we could look at this verse, and I, man, I studied this verse this week. I got all kinds of cool Greek words and Greek things that we could talk about, and we could unpack, and I could probably really impress you with today. But the problem is you would probably still leave here all mixed up. 
It would be like me mixing this Rubik's Cube all up and tossing it to you and telling you to solve it without teaching you the algorithms of how to solve it. So today, rather than diving into the depths of this verse and the Greek around it and, and that, I want to just come back to the practical aspects of it. How do, we, how do we make our lives this living sacrifice? How do we be devoted to the Lord, not to get things from God, not to do things for God, but to give our lives to him? Okay? So we have a lot of points, and we're just going to be able to scratch the surface of each of them. But the good news is, is they're really simple. Just like the algorithms to solve this Rubik's Cube, they're really simple things, and they're things you can apply to your life today that will make a difference in your life today. The first one is this. We have to daily surrender our lives to him. If we want things to come together, if we want our lives to be a living sacrifice for the Lord, we must surrender our lives to him. There's no way out of this one, guys. And I'll tell you, everything that follows this today depends on this one. If you're going to try to keep your life for yourself, if you're going to try to do it your own way, nothing that we're going to talk about from here on forward is going to work. It's all contingent and laid upon the foundation of surrender and submission. The foundation of a disciple's life is built on those two words, surrender and submission. And we, we begin our journey of faith with surrender and submission. We repent of our sins and we surrender our lives to Christ. When we confess Christ as our, as our Lord and our Savior, we are surrendering our lives to him. We're saying, Lord, it's not mine anymore, it's now yours. When we become his disciples, we are surrendering our lives. And church, this never stops. That's not something you do one time at youth camp. It's not something you do one time in church. It's not something you do one time at the crusade or in the tent. For a disciple, we never stop surrendering and submitting our lives to the Lord. We have to do that every day. Every day we have to give up who we are. Every day we have to give up what we want. Every day we have to give up everything and we have to make him everything in our world. And if we do that, we are on our way to getting things squared away. Jesus said this in Luke 9, 23, if anyone wants to follow after me, be my disciple, they want to follow me, he says, let him deny himself and take up his cross once in his life, once a month, every day. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, I'm not saying this is easy, church. In fact, I know from personal experience, this is very hard. It's very complicated. It's very challenging. But nonetheless, it has to be our goal. Every day, I'm going to surrender my life to you. I'm going to submit my life to you. I'm going to surrender myself fully every day to God, his will, his plan, his kingdom. Paul said this to the Galatians. He said in chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. And because of that, he says, I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, he says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if the righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. It's not my life anymore. This is a man who understood that devotion to God was not possible without him sacrificing and submitting his life every single day back to the Lord. That's why he said, I no longer live. It's not mine. There is a desire and a devotion to daily surrender and submit his life in those words. And if we want to get our lives together, if we want to find the significance that God has created us for, it has to start with our surrender and our submission to him. It's not at all about getting more, it's all about giving more. And that starts with giving everything you have right off the bat and surrender to God. Number two is the word sanctification, daily sanctification. 
Now, salvation, salvation is a one-time event. Salvation is a one-time experience. Salvation is something that occurs and fully solves our problem of sin at the moment in which it happens. Salvation is when, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit comes and seals us and redeems us and makes us whole in the eyes of God. Salvation is a one-time thing, but sanctification is a lifelong experience. It's something we have to take part in every single day. Many believers get saved and they start down the road of sanctification. But many leave the path, many leave the road of sanctification sometime after their salvation experience. For some, it's a day or two after they're saved. For others, it's a week or two. For others, it's a year or two. For, for others, maybe it's a decade or two. But for whatever reason, many of us, we, we have our salvation moment, our salvation experience, and we begin the sanctification process, but then over time, because we're unwilling to surrender our lives to Christ... We forsake the sanctification process. And and I think there's many reasons for this, but here's the main one that, that I think is the main reason why people do this. I think the main reason we do this is because our salvation is pretty easy for us. Our salvation costs God everything. It costs him his son. But it costs us very little. It didn't really cost you much to come to the cross and to get on your knees and to repent and give your life to the Lord. Many are happy to do that and they want to do that and they want to explore that because they want to live with God forever and eternity. And it doesn't cost you very much, particularly here in America. It doesn't cost you hardly anything. But the sanctification process, (laughs) that's going to cost you. The sanctification process of daily for the rest of your life, doing this as a lifelong thing, it's hard. And it's going to cost you something along the way. And many people get to a part in this process where they go, you know, I'm just really not willing to surrender and submit that. I'm, I'm just really not willing to give that up. I'm, God, hey, you can go into this nook and this cranny of my heart, but you're not going into that one. I'm keeping that one for me. Or God, you can change this about me and that about me, but you know what? We're not working on that other part over there. I'm I'm keeping that for me. And see, God doesn't want to leave you where you are because he's created you for significance. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life, but sometimes he's got to work some stuff out of you and he's got to work on you before he can do what he wants to do through you. And that's hard. And it gets messy. And we say, okay, I'm going to stop right there. I'm not, ooh, I'm not reading that anymore. I'm going to skip over that chapter, right? Because I don't want to be a part of that. But church, I'm telling you, if you want to find what you were created for, and if you want to see how God has created you for significance, you're going to have to take part daily in the sanctification process that God is doing in your life. Paul said this to the church in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 through 24. He says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, he who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Hey, this church in Thessalonica was not a perfect church. These are by no means perfect people. These are, these are people who could be described as, in many ways, but, but probably not described as model disciples. But Paul is praying that God would sanctify them completely. That they would submit and surrender their lives to his sanctification process so that they could be transformed and changed over the course of their life. And he says, he who calls you is faithful. And he will do this, but you're going to have to submit to it every single day. Church, every day we should be surrendering ourselves to God and his process of sanctification. We should be asking God every day to work on us, to work in us, and then to work through us. 
You see, many, many Christians today want God to work through them before they ever allow God to work in them. Many people want God to work through them and send them on mission trips, or they want God to work through them and use them to win their, their office or their school or their community or their town for Christ. They, they want God to work through them in the lives of their family or in their children. They want and they plead and they ask God to work through them and what, whatever other area it might be. There are a lot of people I'm convinced who really, genuinely, sincerely want God to work through them. And I believe God can use anyone, church. I believe God can use anyone at any time in any way he chooses or wants to. Amen? But here's the reality. Normally, in the normal course of humanity's history, normally God uses the man or the woman who lets him get inside and change them on the inside first. Normally, God uses us most when we let him change us and transform us the most. Normally, he uses those who surrender and submit themselves to his process of sanctification in their lives. We could talk about the Apostle Paul. Yeah, he had the experience on the Damascus Road, but then he goes away for three years so God can work in him before God does things through him. We could talk about Moses out there in the wilderness with the sheep doing his thing as a shepherd for 40 years, y'all. And God is doing things in him to prepare him for what he wants to do through him. We could talk about David. We, we could talk about all kinds of people. Church, I want to encourage you. I want to I tell you this, this week, I want to encourage you to just give it to God and let him do the work in you. Submit to him, surrender to him, and let his process of sanctification take hold in your life. You're going to be better for it. It's going to be hard. It might hurt. It might be painful. It might be frustrating. It might cause you to have to deal with some stuff you really don't want to deal with. But in the end, if you really want to see why you were created for significance, how you were created for significance, and get to that plan and purpose God has for your life, you've got to daily let him sanctify you. And then he'll work through you. So daily surrender and daily sanctification and that leads to number three, which is daily study. Daily study. Now listen, when I say daily study, that can mean different things to different people at different places in their lives and different places in their walk, different places in their spirituality. So I'm not going to get up here today and tell you you need to read the Bible for 10 minutes or you need to read the Bible for 30 minutes or you need to read the Bible for three hours because this is not about checking a box it's not about saying, I completed a task. This is, this is about spending time with the Lord in whatever amount he needs to spend time with you. And that's going to be different for all of us. This isn't about bragging about how much time you spend with God or in his word. It's not about comparing ourselves to each other and trying to figure out who studies the Bible more. But the reality is this. We need to be devoted to the Lord's word. If we're devoted to God, we need to be devoted to his word. If we're devoted to the Lord, then we're going to read the book that he wrote for us. God wrote the Bible for you. Do, you. do you know that? He gave it to you so you would read it, so you would study it, so you would memorize it, so you would meditate on it. It's part of the way he sanctifies your life every day is by getting in his word and studying it every day. You want to hear from God, read his word. I hear people all the time, God doesn't talk to me. Well, then you're not reading the Bible. If you want God to talk to you, the quickest and easiest way to hear from the Lord is to get in the book he wrote for you. It is living, it is active, it's sharper than a double-edged sword. It'll cut you to the marrow. It'll heal your wounds. It'll dry up your tears and then it'll make you cry. <laughs> it'll, it'll do it all. You see, part of our devotion and our daily surrender and our daily submission involves the study of God's holy word. And I don't mean looking at the verse of the day on the, your favorite app on your phone and posting it on social media, making people think you're real spiritual. 
I mean sitting down, praying, meditating, considering what it has to say about your life and allowing it to sanctify you. I mean getting together to discuss it with other people. I mean talking to people about it on the phone. I mean praying about it and letting God's word sanctify you and transform you from the inside out. Paul gives us a good reminder in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. He says, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Now, I know many people struggle with studying God's word consistently. I've struggled with it at times in my life. It can be hard to do this every day, amen? Amen. Amen. It's okay, you can amen. It can be hard to study God's word, amen? There's a lot of reasons for that, own it. I'm gonna give you six things real quick that have helped me in my life, six things. And this isn't a checklist, but I'm just, I'm just trying to help you. Number one, you gotta make it a priority. If you wanna study God's word, it's gotta be a priority. You just have to decide, decide that you're gonna do it. No matter what, it's a priority in your life and it's gonna get done every single day. If, if reading God's word is priority number 10 or 11 or 15 in your life, it's probably not gonna happen. It's got to be a priority. Number two, you got to have a plan. If you're going to read God's word consistently, surrender to this and have a plan. Now, there are all kinds of Bible plans out there that you can find. There's apps for it. There's programs for it. Um, you can download them. There's all kinds of Bible plans. It really doesn't matter which one you do or how you choose to go about it. You don't have to go from Genesis to Revelation. You don't have to you know, go from cover to cover. You can do a Bible reading plan for the Gospels. You can do a Bible reading plan for the Epistles. You can do a Bible reading plan for the, just the Gospel of Matthew or just the Old Testament or just the New or just the Psalms. It doesn't matter, but you need a plan because having a plan will help you make it a priority and it will give you a, a plan of action. And you, you don't just need a, a plan for what you're going to read for the day, you need to plan what time you're going to read it and try to do it at that time every day because it's a priority. You need to plan the place you're going to read it and try to do it in that place at that time every day because it's a priority. And if it's a priority and you make it a plan, you're off to a really good start. Number three, I would tell you to find a partner. Accountability is great when you're reading the Bible. Find somebody else who's on the journey with you and in about the same spiritual place you are who wants to read some of the same stuff you do and just read it together. Read it with somebody, give them the plan or let them give you their plan and y'all work on it together so you can talk about it together. Those, those three things right there will solve most of, of your problems when it comes to making time for God's word. Now, the next three things are the things I do every time I sit down with the Word of God because it, it helps God sanctify me with it. It helps me hear from the Lord whenever I do these three things. So the first one is this. You need to ponder it. You need to not just read it like it's your favorite author writing a novel. You need to really think about what you read. You need to really think about what it's saying. You need to consider how it applies to your life you need to think about why that verse matters to you today. What God wants to do with that. You need to ponder it. Meditate on it. Consider it. Next, praise God for it. I didn't always do this when I was reading the Bible, but, I, but I've noticed over the years as I've incorporated this into my time, every single time I read the Word of God, I thank God for His Word. Even when it cuts me to the bone, even when it shows me how wrong I've been, even when it challenges me, even when it's hard on me, I thank God for his word. I praise him for it. I praise him that I can hold it. I praise him that I can read it. I, I, I praise him that I, I, I have the ability to just be with him through it. These praises or prayers don't have to be long. They don't have to be eloquent. They just... Sincerely thank God for his word. And then here's the last one. Proclaim it. Tell others about what you read. Tell people about what's going on in your life. Tell people about how it's sanctifying you. 
I'm, I'm not saying you've got to become the evangelist where you work or the school you're at. I'm not saying you've got to go stand on the street corner in downtown San Antonio and proclaim it. It's fine if that's what God called you to do. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying as you're visiting with people and talking with people and out and about in your life, share what God's doing. Not so you can get more from God, not, not to impress God, not to check it off a list or a box to say you did it, but just because when you share it and when you proclaim it, number one, it's going to be a blessing to whoever you proclaim it to because God's word doesn't come back void or empty. But number two, it's going to be a blessing to you. God is going to bless you when you do that. So proclaim it. And remember, we don't do these things so we can get more from God. The reality is, is when we're doing these things, we're giving more to God. That's what devotion is all about. The next point is this. We need to daily be involved in some form of service. We need to daily serve or have daily service in our life. Remember what Paul said there in Romans 12, 1, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. He says this is your true worship. When we are living in full submission and surrender to the Lord, when we're being sanctified daily, when we're in the Word of God and studying it daily, there's a very natural thing that will happen in your life. You won't, you won't even have to work on this or think about this. It'll just naturally happen. It'll become a part of your worship. It'll become a part of your praise. It'll become a part of you living as a sacrifice for the Lord, as Paul talks about here in Romans 12. And that is God will start using you in the lives of other people. Jesus is our example for this. Jesus is our example for everything. But Jesus, he says this in Mark chapter 10, verse 43. He says, but it's not so among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man, he says, did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many Listen, church, your service to the Lord does not have to happen here on this campus. I know for some of y'all, y'all are surprised by that. Your service to the Lord doesn't have to happen here. In fact, I'll go so far as to say this. If we're really living as disciples, if we're really living as kingdom-minded people who are devoted and dedicated disciples of Jesus Christ, the overwhelming majority of our service, our spiritual service, will happen outside of these walls and off this campus. You can serve your family, you can serve your friends, you can serve your neighbors, you can serve your co-workers, you can serve the students who surround you at school, you can serve strangers on the street, you can serve the employees you have or you manage. You can serve your customers. If you stand at a checkout station all day long, you can serve people right there. There are so many different ways you can serve people. And I don't see why any reason why all of us should not or cannot serve someone else every single day of our lives. And when we serve, we don't do it to get something from God. We don't do it because we think God's going to bless us for serving someone. We do it because it's a part of our spiritual act of worship. It's a part of us serving God. It's a part of our call. It's a part of our devotion. It's not about getting anything from or getting more from God. It's about giving him more of us so he can show us why we have been created for significance. And for those of y'all who are tired and thinking about the prospect of daily surrendering and daily going through this process of sanctification and daily studying and daily service, you're going to like the next one, okay? This one's going to get you real good if you're tired. I call this the daily Sabbath. You need to rest a little every day. The older I get, the more I value rest. Amen. Some of y'all chuckling, you're supposed to amen. 
And I'll be the first to say, I'm not really good at resting. I find it a constant battle for me to do it because I enjoy what the Lord has called me to do in life. I, I find being efficient and effective and productive, I, I like working. I get to serve the Lord and other people, and I like that. So it's, it's hard for me to rest. But can I tell you, when I give myself to the Lord in moments or days of rest, the spiritual impact of that is very difficult to describe. Certainly don't have time for it today. I've started incorporating something into my life over the last few years um, that I just call a daily Sabbath. 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes of daily rest where I just turn everything else off and I sit alone with God. It's usually right after lunch for me. Phone goes off, text messages go off, the dinging on my computer goes off. Everything goes off. And I, you know, I'll listen to worship music or I'll listen to scripture or I'll sit in silence in prayer. I do different things during that time, but I just get stilled. And, and when you practice this in a biblical way, in a very real way, you know what you're doing? You're giving yourself to God. Because you're saying, God, I'm going to let everything else in my life go for these next few moments. And I'm just going to give myself to you right here, right now. You're letting the world go, and it's going to go on without you just fine. It's going to keep spinning even when you stop for a few minutes, I promise. And you're, you're just letting everything go, and you're pausing to just be in the presence of God. I'm sure you've heard about the day of rest. The Sabbath mentioned in Exodus 20, 8 through 10, where it says, Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. You're to labor six days and do all your work, but on the seventh day, it's a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock, or the resident alien who is within your gates. And taking a full day of rest to enjoy the presence of God and just give yourself to God is absolutely wonderful. But what if you just took a little mini Sabbath every day? If you daily just gave yourself to the Lord for a set period of time where you just left your phone in the other room or turned it off. And these can be simple, guys. It can be as simple as just leaving your phone in the house where you can't hear it and going out on the back porch and watching the sunset every afternoon or watching it come up in the morning. It can be as simple as taking 15 minutes at the end of your lunch break to just close your eyes and go sit in your truck and listen to scripture or music and just be still in the presence of God. It can be working out in the garden, pulling up weeds, just being in the presence of God without any other distractions, just being in a place where God can get to you and nobody else can. I guess what I'm saying is it doesn't have to be fancy or complicated, but if you'll just do it, if you'll just give yourself to the Lord for those little mini Sabbaths, if you'll put the effort into doing that a little bit every day, I think you will see a major blessing in your life. And it'll remind you every day why God's created you for significance. This next one is what I call daily stewardship. And just like with the Sabbath, it's, it's not exactly what you're probably thinking when you hear the word stewardship. It's not about money. Don't worry. You don't have to grab your pocketbook. It's not about what you're putting in the offering can at all. It's just about making the most of every single day the Lord gives you. It's about approaching the day every day and saying, Lord, I'm going to make the most of this day. I'm going to be a good steward of the life you've given me. I'm going to surrender it all to you, and I'm going to do what you want me and need me to do today. I'm going to give myself fully to your plan and your purposes this day. It's about not wasting a single day, but instead being intentional about stewarding your days wisely. Paul told the Ephesians in chapter 5, verse 15, he said, pay careful attention then to how you walk. Not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. We see encouragement like this in other places like Galatians 6.10, where it says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. 
You see, the point is it matters what we do with our time. And we should make every possible effort to be wise with it. Not, not with the purpose or idea of getting more from God, but with the idea and the purpose of giving more to God. That's what devotion really looks like. And in a very practical way, we're offering him our lives and we say, Lord, I'm going to make the most of this day you've given me. I'm not going to waste it. It's not about getting more, but it's about giving more. The next one is the word sow. We need to daily sow something. We know that there's no doubt a major theme in the Bible of sowing and reaping. And many times when we talk about this theme, we focus on what we're going to get. But again, this principle in the Bible is not about what we get. It starts with what we give. As a devoted disciple of Jesus, we should sow seeds. We can sow seeds of love and grace and peace and joy and hope. We can sow seeds of salvation and repentance. We should be sowing seeds of the gospel every day, everywhere we go. Not because we want to get anything from God, but because we want to give God every part of us and everything we have to give. It was, after all, Jesus who commanded us in Matthew 28 to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, he says, I'm with you always to the end of the age. We have to sow the seeds of the gospel into the lives of others because when we give that to God, when we're sowing things into the world in which we live, we're doing what Paul's talking about in Romans 12, where we're giving all of our lives to him as spiritual worship. That's what devotion looks like. And when we do this, we too are going to figure out why God created us and the significance we were created for. This next one is the word supplication. I know supplication, daily supplication. I know supplication is a specific kind of praying where we're interceding for others, and that's important. I think of verses like Ephesians 6.18 where it says, pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer request and stay alert with all perseverance and supplication or intercession for the saints. Or I, I think of verses like Philippians 4, 6. It says, don't worry about anything. That's a good word for today. But in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. That's supplication. And we should pray like that. There's nothing wrong with praying like that unless that's all your prayers contain. You see, many times our prayers are nothing more than a laundry list of things we want to get from God. I'm using this idea of daily supplication not as a, a way to get things from God, but I want to expand on it and just use it about prayer in general. See, for most of my life as a Christian and for most of my time even as a pastor, I've seen my times of prayer with the Lord as an opportunity to get stuff from him. And I know the Lord wants us to bring our request to him. I'm not telling you not to do that. I still do that. That's important. I, I think you should do that as well. But honestly, over about the last 9 to 12 months, I've been making it more and more of a point in my life to make my time of prayer less about what I'm getting and more about what I'm giving. And I, I can't express, there's no way, I tried this week to think about a way to express to you in words the profound impact that has had on my life, and I can't come up with a way all I can do is tell you it makes a difference. So this week, I just want to challenge you to make your prayers less about what you want to get and make them more about what God wants you to give and just see what happens. And I think you're going to see the same thing I did. I think you're going to see that it makes a profound difference in the way you pray and how you pray and the things God does in your life and how you view the significance God has created you for. I really do believe you were created for significance. I really do believe every single one of us was created for significance. And I believe that the key to our devotion is not what we get from God, but it's what we give to God. 
I also believe that this has the power to change more than just your life or your circumstances that you're in right now. I believe this has the power to change the world. And I have proof of it. I have proof that it has the power to change the world. His name is Jesus. And this man, Jesus Christ, this man is the supreme example of this principle that it's not about getting more, it's about giving more. He gave his life for you, he gave his life for me, he gave his life for each and every one of us. He died on a cross took our sins. He was the sinless, perfect Lamb of God, and He took our sins. He gave His life for us so we could be set free. It goes back to that verse in Mark chapter 10. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. And that has changed the world. It's not about getting Devotion, I mean, the true example of devotion is Jesus on the cross. Lord, not my will, but yours be done, he prayed in the garden. That's devotion. The true example of devotion is right there for all of us to see, and it has nothing to do with what you're going to get. It has everything to do with what you're going to give. So I want to challenge you this week, disciples, to consider giving these things, and if you do... It's like knowing just a couple of algorithms. You can take something that's all mixed up and all messed up and all jacked up and something you've been trying your own way to get to come together forever and you can get it to look right if you'll just put into place what God has already told you to do. It's not about getting, it's about giving. Let's pray. If you're here today or can hear my voice and have never given your life to the Lord, we want to invite you this morning to have an opportunity to do that. We want to invite you to call on Christ as your Lord and Savior, not by raising a hand or standing or coming to the front, but just by praying there where you are. If that's you, just say this, say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray, so I ask now by faith that you would change me and make me new. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me of my sins and give me the great gift of eternal life. I thank you for your grace and your goodness, for your love and for your mercy, and for saving me today. Father, as we close today, I I pray, Lord, you would help us this week to do these simple things, though they're simple to talk about and simple to list and simple to even see on a piece of paper. Lord, they're hard to do. There's nothing easy about it, being devoted. There's nothing quick or simple about it. But there is something incredibly special (laughs) and significant about it. And Lord, if we want to realize and understand and truly, Father, truly comprehend what it means to be created for significance, these are some of the key things we're going to have to do. Because we're never going to know the truth of our significance until we are fully devoted to you. So Father, I just pray that you would help us to do that. Help these who have gathered here to do it. Lord, help us in the area of grace to forgive ourselves when we fall short one day when we don't get it done. Help us to get back up the next day and return to that spirit of devotion and to try again. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We ask your blessing now as we come to your table to take part in the Lord's Supper as we remember your devotion and your sacrifice and your love. Father, bless this time as well. In Jesus' name, amen.